right ঠিক আছে uh good morning uh, today we will discuss about uh, rotor dynamics as you know in any machinery uh, rotating shaft is a very critical uh, component so in this lecture on rotor dynamics i'll be just covering the basics of rotor dynamics from a condition monitoring point of view uh, in fact uh, rotor dynamics itself is a full fledged uh, 40 hours <coughs> course and uh, in this lecture of 1 hour we are just trying to discuss about uh, the important aspects of rotor dynamics and how actually uh, the problems of unbalance in a rotor uh, misalignment and the effect of the support stiffnesses uh, play a role in the dynamics of the rotating shaft system okay and in uh, practice we will be finding many rotor systems comprising of turbines compressors uh, pumps uh, with impellers sets of impellers or fans with sets of blowers and so on so rotor dynamics uh, is very important that we understand the physics of such rotating machines and then uh, how do we try to control the unbalance forces control the rotor dynamic stability etc ca calculate the critical speeds and so on so the basic objectives of uh, rotor dynamics is you know predict critical speeds and so on well well let me let explain to you what this what i mean by a rotor system i have a long rotor which is essentially supported in some sort of a bearing and this is undergoing a speed of rotation omega it's rotating at a certain speed and this is the span of the rotor okay this bearings have certain stiffness say k1 k2 okay and there could be a heavy mass m on the rotor so if this rotor uh, stiffnesses are constant and stiff from the bearing bearing supports are rigid or soft when we have rigid stiffness on the supports and the simple disc which is rotating this is basically a disc we have the simple jeff cot rotor many physics is understood by understanding the jeff cot rotor where we have a rigid support stiffness and then we have a certain disc which is rotating so when they are rotating we will have what is known as the critical speed a certain speed at which the speed is equal to the natural frequency of the system and then we are going to have the condition of resonance so this is very very important in the rotor systems well i have shown here one disc there could be multiple discs for example in 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 actual conditions think of an aero engine or aircraft engine which is essentially a gas turbine engine so we have a long system wherein we have the first stage is maybe a 
compressor set and then we have the high, high pressure turbine followed by another low pressure turbine we have the air coming in inlet air maybe some sort of a fan could be here fan and <coughs> this compressors there will be there are lot of set of vanes and same is true in the case of turbines and then we have the exhaust which essentially gives the thrust to the engine for uh, propulsion of course in between we have the combustion system of course you know, i am not going to do go into details of the gas turbine but essentially our domain of interest is this drawn here in red uh, and then this portion here and this is this is the long shaft uh, which are essentially these are all supported on uh, maybe bearings intermediate bearings so a typical uh, gas turbine engine has uh, this kind of a configuration wherein on a long shaft i have a compressor followed by a set of uh, couple of high pressure turbines low pressure turbines and each of these uh, system rotates at a very very high rotational speed and typically of the order of 30000 40000 rpm so you can imagine uh, we have such a engineering complex system wherein on a shaft i have sets of vanes or blades which are mounted on discs there could be multiple discs and uh, they are rotating at a very very high rpm now think of a scenario there could be many issues one is what if the rotating speed it has a speed which equals to the natural frequency of the system okay then there will be condition of resonance so condi condition of resonance occurs when this <coughs> critical speed <coughs> is equal to the natural frequency of the system <coughs> so when a uh, aircraft is rotating or air, sorry not uh, the engine is rotating and it is powering the aircraft and there could be conditions of resonance and because of this what would what could happen is there could be large uh, amplitudes and large motions and this shaft because of resonance if it is having if it is going to have large motions okay it may so happen if this was the casing okay and then uh, this blade sets may touch the casing so there could be lateral rubs okay so this can lead to lot of things high amplitudes high amplitudes this this could further lead to rubs 
between rotor system and the stator in this case it is the casing. So, a lot of wear and tear will occur materials may fail components may fail ok and then this is one instances. So, <coughs> in, in by studying rotor dynamics if we can physically model such a system ok through techniques of the analytical formulation or through the techniques of uh, or finite element method okay. we can try to estimate the critical speeds and avoid them during the operations. So, this is what is one of the <coughs> one of the important objectives of studying rotor dynamics. The next is determine design modifications to change critical speeds. Now, we can change the uh, do certain design modifications to change the critical speeds through these mathematical models we can change the <coughs> mass stiffness of the appropriate system and change the uh, critical speeds you know omega n is equal to root over k by m. So, this we can play around as a designer we can play around with the values of k's and m's and change the critical speeds. We have in one case wherein <coughs> there is lot of rotating systems many rotating systems subsystems in one unit that could be for example, a motor driving a gearbox, driving a set of blades. Okay. So, and they are all rotating the shafts are rotating. Okay. motor driving a gearbox driving a set of blower ok. All of them have rotary inertias and then they have the uh, corresponding the rotary uh, displacements etcetera. So, such subsystems ok can have the and then you have the natural frequencies like in the case of a linear system we had multiple degrees of freedom and every degree of freedom has a corresponding natural frequency when you have the torsional rotating systems every subsystem subsystem 1 subsystem 2 subsystem 3 each of the subsystems can also be having natural frequencies and these are basically torsional natural frequencies and if we can predict them and then know them beforehand we can as an uh, designer or an operator ensure that we do not run the system at its natural frequencies okay so, uh, estimating the critical speeds, uh, doing design modifications and then estimating the natural frequencies of torsional vibration is very, very important in the study of rotor dynamics. Okay. And the next would be in a rotating system, if you think the case of an uh, like the gas turbine we just talked about, there is a small amount of unbalance in one of the veins or the blades. And uh, once they rotate at high speeds, you know, we will be having very, very high unbalance uh, forces okay. and these forces are radial in nature and because of this unbalance forces, uh, we will be having um, forces at the bearing supports and sometimes these forces could be very, very high and then we have to ensure how to reduce these forces otherwise the bearings do not come off the supports or the bearings are not able to withstand such high forces. 
So, as a good designer, we have to ensure that the unbalanced mass rotates at its center of rotation or everything is centered around the rotation and not away. Suppose, I have an unbalanced mass m at a distance r, I am always going to have an unbalanced force m omega square r and this is uh, going to be harmful to my uh, bearings. If I put the bearings here, it will be harmful. So, this has to be calculate the uh, we can do the balance correction and locate a location from the measured vibration data. Now, we'll, when you talk about balancing in the few classes uh, down the road, uh, we will see how we can uh, balance such unbalanced forces either in single plane or in multiple planes and give correcting unbalanced masses. So, that the net effect is reduced. For example, in this case, if I have an unbalanced mass at a distance r on this direction, I can give another unbalanced mass of the same quantity at distance r opposite. You know, if I if I draw in this plane, if I have an unbalanced mass, if I have unbalanced mass here, okay, I can give a correction mass here. I can uh, reduce this forces, okay, the net forces. And then <coughs> another uh, uh, problem is, you know, we can also predict the amplitudes of this vibration caused by such rotor imbalance. Now, I am having these two words synchronous. So, if when a system is rotating at a particular rpm, we denote it say omega as 1 times x which is the rotational speed and any vibrations at this frequency is actually known as the synchronous vibration. So, any frequency less than omega is sub synchronous and any frequency greater than omega is super synchronous. Okay. Later on you will see when this rotating shaft is uh, rotating at a particular speed. having a disk. Okay. There will be speeds at which there will be a lot of dynamic instability okay. and uh, in fact, this is one of the serious problems in the limitations of rotor speeds. In particular, if you, if you plot it as omega, maybe the amplitude of at, at certain speeds and you know, what will happen. Okay, these are the Which, which in this case, if we increase the speed, so there is a critical speed beyond which we should not operate or if we have to operate it, uh, how this can be controlled and the I uh, will just tell you right now by controlling the damping at the supports, we can control this dynamic instability in rotor systems. And uh, there are many ways to suppress this dynamic instability.
this is essentially by designing or incorporating or changing damping at supports and uh, this has been possible by you know if you, if you think of a by a having a what is known as a squeeze film damper in the case of journal bearings and uh, sometimes in uh, rolling element bearings which are essentially very high stiffness bearings okay almost rigid supports in some way by having an sfd uh, squeeze film dampers in the outer race some amount of damping control can be done of course you know people have uh, used uh, magnetic bearings to control uh, dynamic instability in rotors okay and uh, that is still uh, right now in uh, still in a research stage i would say or very few practical applications have come out of magnetic bearings to control the dynamic instability in uh, small systems they have been successful but in large systems uh, there are other issues with uh, using magnetic bearings but uh, traditionally squeeze film dampers have been used in the case of uh, journal bearings to suppress this dynamic instability and uh, though we use rolling element bearings uh, some amount of sfd particularly in aircraft engines this has been done to support the dynamic uh, suppress the dynamic instability so to summarize uh, the objectives of rotor dynamic analysis as i have listed here are predict the critical speeds determine the design modifications to change the critical speeds predict natural frequencies of torsional vibration calculate uh, the balance correction masses and location from measured vibration data predict amplitudes of synchronous vibration caused by rotor imbalance predict threshold speeds and vibration frequencies for dynamic instability determine design modifications to suppress dynamic instabilities now there is a, a lot of things happen when we are rotating a shaft at its at a particular omega okay so there will be a whirling of the shaft okay and this is the bow of the shaft first assumption is we have consider the shaft is flexible so that it can bow okay so this whirl amplitude maybe if i denote it as u is the our objective is to reduce this whirling amplitude because what happens if it whirls sometimes it may foul with the casing in a system about this is my casing so once it touches here these are the regions where rubs are going to occur and this is going to creates wear and tear excess force and then material may fail okay as i was telling you to reduce the synchronous wheel amplitudes i have to balance the rotor so that the sun balance mass is a minimum so the does not fly out or avoid rotating at that particular speed omega 
try to change the speed and if nothing is possible at this bearings we can use SFD so that the support uh, forces onto the uh, onto the bearings is going to reduce. Okay. Now, if I think of a rotor system, suppose. Let me just draw this. The ratio of the dynamic force to the forces on the supports when the supports have a rigid stiffness and this is U. And now, if I increase the damping, where F infinite is the force at the support in the case of rigid supports. Example, our rolling element bearings. So, if I have a shaft which is supported on rolling elements bearing, okay, and if this is going to have an amplitude u, the f infinite any location will be half m omega square u, okay, and you will see for large machines this force is very very high when the m is high or at high speeds the forces are very very high in case of uh, large rotating systems when you are talking about say steam turbine which is uh, essentially used in uh, say power plants okay the four, if they were supported on a rigid uh, bearings, okay, like like rolling element bearings, ball and um, ball bearings, etc., the forces on the support would be very very high. Okay, and uh, we have to, and there is no way, no mechanism, no physics by which we can reduce this uh, forces which are coming to the uh, supports. Uh, there are another way by which we can reduce these forces. Okay, and that is where which is known as the journal bearings. Okay, but I should uh, just give you an example. In journal bearings, essentially what happens, I will come to the journal bearing first. Suppose I have a soft which is uh, rotating okay and this is uh, filled with oil and because of the eccentricity between the center of the journal and the center of the shaft okay i will have a converging diverging section okay and this shaft is rotating like this and the journal is fixed 
Okay. Because of this converging divergent section, there will be a fluid pressure. Okay. This hydrodynamic force which happens because of the <coughs> converging section and the fluid viscosity the load of the shaft load which is coming m g can be supported by the bearing forces, because this will give a lift force. So, when I rotate a shaft at an omega okay, in a journal, wherein it is filled with a viscous fluid, because of the eccentricity E, okay, uh, this fluid will develop try to build up a pressure okay, and this pressure is going to act in the upward direction and support the weight which is coming at the support. So, in the general bearings essentially the, the fluid viscosity comes into the play and we can introduce damping okay, and thus reduce the force which is coming on to the bearing. If I go back to this plot here, this is because of the journal bearing and this is because of the rolling element bearing. So, I can reduce the loads coming to the supports by introducing damping, which is only possible when a journal bearing. So, in any system like in the case of the steam turbines, power plants, if I have a large system a large shaft, a long shaft carrying a lot of uh, disc of the compressors, turbines etcetera and if they were supported on rolling element bearings, what would happen is a lot of forces would come on to the supports. Okay. Instead, if I use a journal bearing and then in journal bearing is uh, because of the fluid viscosity and the eccentricity of the shaft from the center of rotation. I will uh, build up uh, generate a fluid pressure, pressure up acting in the upward direction and then this is able to support the loads coming onto the supports and reduce the uh, forces. And uh, this can be very easily controlled by varying the amount of fluid, uh, fluid flow, the uh, viscosity etcetera, this can be changed and then I can reduce the forces. So, invariably in many of the stationary plants, you will see that uh, the large plants which are on earth, on ground rather is the better word to use, we can have general bearings. Okay which will uh, try to reduce the forces coming onto them. And on this general bearings, if I have a squeeze film damper, basically I have a system wherein I am uh, squeezing and having a vertical motion radially. Okay, I, can, I can put a squeeze film dampers and basically and this is made to oscillate along the outer race and then this basically this I can introduce damping and as you have seen by introducing damping at the supports, the load which is carried at the supports uh, does reduce and this is. So, uh, damping has a very, very important role in rotor dynamics as to it can reduce the support forces, it can control instability. Okay. So, if I have to go back the effect of the support bearing stiffness, bearing support flexibility can greatly reduce the dynamic load transmitted through the bearings like we just discussed by having the support flexibility properly selected 
I can reduce the dynamic load which is transmitted through the bearings. Bearing support damping increases the dynamic load transmitted through the bearings at high speeds as is also obvious from that plot. Bearing support stiffness may be necessary to keep the transmitted load within acceptable limits while traversing the vertical speed. Okay. Improperly chosen support parameters can produce dynamic loads in excess of the rigid support values. And, uh, imagine in the suppose the I have chosen certain parameters of damping such that the forces are very very high then we are going to have a failure of the supports okay, and this will not be uh, accepted or allowed. So, how we can reduce that. Now, what do I mean by rotor dynamic instability? Super synchronous vibrations due to soft alignment, misalignment. Okay. Sub synchronous and super synchronous vibrations due to cyclic variations of parameters mainly caused by loose bearings or shaft rubs. Non synchronous rotor wheeling that becomes unstable. Okay. So, these are the conditions wherein uh, we have to be careful to avoid such conditions. So, we need to obviously have a shaft which is perfectly aligned, uh, we need to should not have any loose components which will give rise to soft rubs. Okay. So, these are the conditions which we can uh, avoid, so that the dynamic instability does not happen. Okay. And uh, with uh, this I will tell you, uh, there is one, suppose I have this R p m curve and these are the first natural frequency second natural frequency. So, there will be some frequencies and this, these are basically known as the, the Campbell diagram. So, there are regions on which you know we would like to avoid operating at these zones. Okay, wherein your uh, runoff speed okay, should be such that you know you are operating at a speed at which you are below the this natural frequencies or operating at a speed you are in between these natural frequencies. So, this kind of RPM which is natural frequencies plots are to be generated for multiple rotor systems or rotor large rotor systems. So, that the conditions of resonances because of uh, the critical speeds are avoided. Okay. So, with this uh, basic understanding about the importance of uh, support bearing stiffness and how support bearing stiffnesses contribute the, to the overall forces which are coming onto the supports. Uh, when we design a turbo machinery, these are some of the things which one needs to keep in mind. Avoid critical speeds if possible, if you have to operate through the critical speeds you know traverse it very quickly. Like in suppose a gas turbine you know we have to rotate at 30,000 rpm. Once you go from start to 30,000 rpm I am sure there will be number of resonances you have to pass through. So, quickly you need to change over to the resonance, uh, uh, quickly you need to move into the operating speed of 30,000. We cannot be moving or rotating constantly at the same natural frequency. The, so, the ramp up or the speed up has to be very, very high. Minimizing dynamic response at resonance, if critical speeds must be traversed is what just what we discussed. We need to move up the speed increasing mechanism very quickly. Minimize vibration and dynamic loads transmitted to the machine structure throughout the operating speed range. Avoid turbine or compressor blade tip or seal rubs. Avoid rotor dynamic instability. Avoid torsional vibration 
resonance or torsional instability of the drive train system. So, as you can imagine a turbo machinery is a very very complex uh, mechanism uh, other than the you know the fluid mechanics uh, operations uh, the fluid machines part of it wherein we have a certain energy coming in certain energy going out and then we get a thrust. But beyond that uh, there is a lot of uh, engineering into a uh, designing a perfect turbo machinery as to its dynamics is concerned in terms of uh, not rotating at its critical speed, how to avoid critical speeds, how to traverse up high speeds, how to avoid instability, how to avoid uh, rotor uh, um, uh, rubs between the stator and the rotors. So, these are and how to avoid uh, multiple resonances in torsional, torsional systems. So, these are the complex issues of turbine machinery. We can talk of our aircraft engine, steam turbine even a large set of uh, pumps, but these have to be taken into account you know this some of them are uh, vertical you know, in if you go to many of the power plants particularly the hydro power plants you will see a lot of the vertical you know maybe uh, the Kaplan turbine etcetera. Vertical turbines uh, the shafts are not horizontal, but vertical we have the effect of the gravity loads altogether on the on the bearings you know how to how do you select the bearings, the thrust bearings, the pivot bearings, the pad bearings etcetera. Now, how do you how do you take care of these issues? So, a turbo machinery from a dynamics point is a very very complex uh, thing. As a designer people do take care of it, but then our goal uh, in this class is uh, how do we maintain and monitor the health of such a large complex uh, turbo machineries. So, uh, just uh, to recap you now we have already discussed about the bearings you know uh, the bearings essentially are the of the two types the rolling element bearing or the general uh, bearing uh, fluid fluid film bearing. And uh, as you know in uh, the rolling element bearing we have the outer race the inner race and the rolling elements which could be either a roller or a ball and then they are supported by what is known as a retainer or a cage which ensures that the no two rolling elements come in contact with each other. And basically they are used for rigid supports. So, in essence rolling elements are good where the rigid the forces on the supports are less because when the forces are very very high because of the physical dimensions of the bearings they may not be able to support very very high loads as in the case of the turbines which we discussed about. But the other kind of bearing is the general bearing or the fluid film. So, basically in the journal I, I have a shaft and because of this film and because of this converging diverging section and because of the eccentricity of the shaft there is a pressure build up and this pressure is actually supporting the shaft. Okay. So, in no point when during rotation there is any rigid contact no rigid contact between the shaft and the journal only may be at rest. Okay. This is in contact. So, every time you start or stop a machine the entire rotor system comes and sits on this. So, there is a lot of wear and tear in the journal. 
wear and tear in the journal. That is why these journals are made out of uh, soft materials, soft bearing material like babbits, etcetera, which can be withstand a high temperature as well. and which should be able to. So, because of the physics of the journal bearing, they can support large loads. So, <coughs> basically all the steam turbines etcetera or the gas turbines which are land based, we have journal bearings. Okay. And uh, basically uh, this film lubrication is the hydrodynamic lubrication which is occurring. But in this uh, journal bearings, the pressure uh, was actually built up because of the eccentricity of the shaft and the journal and because and thus creating a converging divergent section. But if I have a source of externally pressurizing the fluid and applying it to the journal, I could be supporting the large uh, loads which are coming at the bearing supports and such are the hydro static bearings and of course, you know we are not going to go into the de de details of the bearings, but as opposed to hydrodynamic bearings or the general bearings, there is never any contact between the shaft and the journal. So, very precision instruments or equipment have such hydrostatic bearings, where in we apply externalized uh, pressurized uh, f um, oil or lubrication into the journal and the shaft. Okay. And then uh, but in our case, <coughs> we have the journal bearings or the rolling element bearings. So, in rolling element bearings, if I in the outer race, if I have some provision of adding a squeeze film damping arrangement, wherein I can change the damping arrangements, which is there actually in the aircraft engines, other than the rigid uh, rotating uh, element bearings, they also have a squeeze film dampers on the periphery which is which will not rotate, but only oscillate and thus create this uh, damping and as you know because of the damping the forces on the bearing support comes down. But uh, when you talk about a general bearing, we can have the cases wherein uh, uh, the uh, because of the fluid uh, wedge conditions the oil is uh, lifted off or the oil picks up and gives a pressure and the support soft uh, is picked up is held at a position. But then uh, in rotor dynamics also we do a lot of tests on the rotor dynamics systems to understand from a condition monitoring point of view or from a, a dynamic uh, analysis point of view. These are some of the tests which are done on the rotor dynamic systems. One is to begin with is the static stiffness test or now what is known as the impedance measurements of the system. So, at the bearing support stiffness okay, at one location, I can give a force and measure the deflection. Okay. Okay, by having a transducer, this deflection could be measured by an LVDT or even you can put an accelerometer and then integrate it to get the deflection. So, just to know the static stiffness k delta, I can use such an arrangement wherein we give in a force measure the deflection and find out the static stiffness. Okay. Many a times to understand the cases of the resonances, we can do a co-stop test, wherein we increase the rpm. Okay. at a particular rate or come down from a high speed coast down. Particularly in the case of the journal bearing, uh, a very important uh, thing happens uh, like in this journal bearing you would think here basically the forces here at, at uh, the if you enlarge this, okay, 
one is at rest and other is moving at a speed of omega okay omega v by r so linear speed so there'll be a point wherein the entire film in the middle will be having a speed of omega by 2 okay so this fluid in the wedge is approximately theoretically moving at a frequency of 0 0.5 omega or the fluid is churning fluid is churning is the or whirling at a speed of 0.5 omega okay but usually because of the frictional losses this frequency is around 0 0.42 to 0 0.48 of f where f is the rotational speed okay so any time i am having a shaft rotating at a frequency of f i will see a predominant frequency somewhere around 0 0.42 to 0 0.48 f so, when you do a coast up and coast down analysis, you will be very easily seeing the effect of whirling and this can be removed by changing the damping etcetera. Okay. In the laboratory, you know we have a rotor rigs wherein at one end we have a general bearing wherein we have a particular type of lubricant and then say for example, an oil and next time we have a kerosene, you will see the effect of whirling uh, pretty much there. Okay. Many times we do a lot of constant speed measurements in uh, rotor systems okay. and of course, the last one is the resonance test which we do on the rotor systems to find out the natural frequencies of such systems so that we can avoid rotating at the natural frequencies. So, some of the common faults uh, which occurs in turbo machinery are the cases of imbalance, misalignment. Uh, load variations, mechanical uh, loosenesses, critical speed or resonance, excessive clearance in the fluid film bearings, rotor rub, oil whip and oil whirling. Another important thing happens as an oil uh, whip. For example, we are going at a uh, rotating at a particular frequency, but this frequency happens to be an oil whirling has occurred. Oil whirling occurs at 0 0.42 to point 48F is this oil uh, whirling occurs, what happens it will there will be some multiples at which this will be equal to the natural frequency of the system. In such a case, the okay, and then this is going to whip around at that frequency, if it is going to bow and then it will be latching on to this frequency and that is known as whipping frequency. This we will discuss when we talk about the case of uh, unbalanced responses and rotor systems where this whipping occurs. Okay, uh, so, to summarize uh, in this uh, class uh, we discussed about the requirements on what we do in rotor dynamic analysis how basically the bearing support stiffness and in particular the damping plays a role in the support uh, forces which come to the supports and then how we can uh, select the kind of bearing the rolling element bearings or the hydrodynamic bearings to take care of the loads and then uh, what are the defects which could be there in rotor dynamic systems and then how we avoid them. Okay. Thank you.